I just got done reading a book called Team Topologies by Matthew Skelton and Manuel Pius. Team Topologies, organizing business and technology teams for fast flow. And uh, I really wanted to take some time and uh, digest the concepts of the book. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I also thought at the same time, it was a pretty thin book, quite honestly. Read in uh, like a single, I would say a single week, but in actuality it was like three days. It read very fast. But uh, I also felt that the book had two audiences. One audience was people working on development teams Mm -hmm. who kind of understood how teams work together. And the other audience was people that don't work in development. I really felt when I was reading the book, if you don't work in development at all, you were going to, this is going to be a real dry book for you. Right. Right. If you just, but, but if you understand organizational design, it's probably pretty easy. So what I'm going to do on this podcast is I'm going to bring up the website. I'll try to, for the people that are just listening to the audio, I'll try very hard to just narrate what I'm doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to teamtopologies.com. That's their website. Teamtopologies.com slash key dash concepts, which I'll, I'll put the link in the description when I post this podcast. These are the core ideas out of the book. And I, I specifically did not want them to see this ahead of time. I have not seen this and I didn't even know about Team Topology. So yeah. completely yeah. a the blind book, study for me. The book was 2019. This book was written. So it's fairly recently, although they did a lot of studies and stuff, but, but the book itself was not written until 2019. So the concept of the book is there are four types of teams and three interactions between teams. Mm-hmm. That's the model. Anything over and above that is waste. So here we go. Lean principles. There we go. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So let's kick off with the majority of what your development efforts should be focused on. They what they call stream aligned teams. Stream aligned teams are aligned to a flow of work from usually a segment of the business domain. He separates the idea of a stream aligned team, meaning they're aligned with the value stream. Yeah. He specifically separates that from the concept of a feature team. Mm-hmm. And in, I, I've tracked his work down, Manuel Pius, I've tracked his work down and I've seen him present this idea at, at, at different places. At different places? How can you do that online? I, I've seen him present this idea in different videos at different conferences. Yeah, a bunch of places. Where he says they're different from feature teams because the thing about feature teams is they're they're usually, feature teams take shortcuts and scope things down to a small segment in order to get things out. And then they may go on to the other, to the next shiny thing. They're not necessarily sticking around to maintain the things that they're building on feature teams. Although I like that description of feature teams to me kind of sells feature team short because I'm like, well, if they built the feature, if you build it, you should own it. So feature teams and stream aligned teams to me are fairly similar. But, uh, you know, like I said, he he's drawing the distinction and why he's using different terminology because stream aligned teams, they're taking all of the work in that business domain, in that segment. And there may be many of them, right? If you have many, many features under one product, there may be many stream aligned teams. But again, the, the idea is they should be autonomous. Everything about the you know, typical scrum teams, like they should be autonomous. They shouldn't have dependencies. They should be empowered to do the work. And that that's his concept of stream aligned teams. Yeah. So we've heard about aligning around the value stream, right? Yeah. So I'm not sure how what he's saying is different. Like, I guess what is his central thesis? I'm not sure I caught that. Uh, for streamlined teams or for the whole thing? For the whole thing. Like th- this team topologies thing. Oh, I oh, get the streamlined oh, piece. Uh, for the whole thing. So his thesis. It's a clear, easy to follow approach for modern software delivery with an emphasis on optimizing team interactions for flow. This is how to organize your teams for optimum flow. So if you follow his rules and buy his book, everything will be great. <laughs> Where have we heard that before? <laughs> yes. But in this case, I think we should at least hear him out. Oh, absolutely. You know? Yeah. So his main one and the one that takes a, a good chunk of the book is streamlined teams. Again, so the yeah. overview for the book is he's giving you the makeups of the teams, like the purpose of the different types of teams. And there are four. He, he segments them into four categories. And then he says there are three ways that teams interact with each other and anything outside of that is waste. So here are your types of teams and what they should be doing. Here are the ways that teams should be dealing with one another 
and anything outside of that is waste. You should eliminate that for your organization. And he goes into a, a good depth in the book about helping you understand Conway's law, mm-hmm. which you talked about last night. We did. We talked about last night in our local networking event. Now, let's see if I can pull up a definition for Conway, Conway's law. Here is a, oh, Atlassian. Oh, Jesus. I'm definitely not using them as a source. Conway's law, it's an adage. I like adage. I should have gotten Conway's research for this podcast. Organizations design systems that mirror their own communication structure. Computer programmer Melvin Conway, who introduced this idea in 1967. Quote, an organization that designs a system, defined broadly, will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. It's amazing that theories from 1967 are still as alive and kicking today as everyone tries to reinvent the wheel, you know. They're reinventing the reinvented wheels since the 60s. Conway's Law, couple Conway's Law and Deming's research and don't add anything else. Don't add any more certifications. Don't add anything. Run your whole business with just those two things. Yeah, uh, you wouldn't need a whole lot more, to be honest. Conway's Law, Team Cognitive Load, and responsive organizational evolution. Like uh, responsible organizational evolution. He doesn't talk about this much in the book. Yeah. But I feel this is the category where most agilists can probably talk all day about like your business should be rigged where they can respond very quickly to changes. Either changes in the environment or yeah. changes from the business or changes from customers or wh- whatever it is, like responsive organizational evolution. If your organization is set up in a way where you are super slow to respond, you're going to fall behind. Yeah, right. this, this is the organization structural equivalent to responsive design in software engineering. Right. Well, if your organization is set up where you get the, 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 the head honcho at the top and there is a reporting structure down and he's got directors and each director's got a group of people and everything's got to go all the way back up to have a decision and any one person in the chain can stop the thing from moving forward and you got to go get your boss's boss and... You gotta get the bobs involved and yeah that's responsive organizational evolution this is an interesting one team cognitive load because we don't talk about cognitive load like we don't talk about that on the podcast i don't i don't know if we've ever brought that up i don't think we have cognitive load relates to the amount of information that working memory can hold at one time since working memory has limited capacity instructional methods should avoid overloading it with additional activities that don't directly contribute to learning. This is limiting whip for your cognition. I think of cognitive load as not only limiting whip, but limiting the domain that the team's involved in. I think of a team that I was on one time. Actually, I think of when I was a team lead, actually. Let me let me go back to when I was a team lead. Yep. When I was a team lead, let me think about this story. It's not a great story. When I was a team lead, the cognitive load on the team lead in the organization I was in was just ridiculous because you had some managerial aspects that you had to deal with in your job. You did a first pass people's performance reviews. Mm -hmm. So you would be keeping track of things that people are doing for their performance reviews. You would also have to know the status of every project that all your people in the department were working on because somebody around the organization that higher up, especially in cross departments, like another leader, another manager, they could come they wouldn't come and ask the individual team member, where is your project at? They would come and ask you, the team lead, hey, where is the project at for your team members that you have on these projects and expect you to know? You also were in charge of and expected to be involved in the, the most complicated customer support issues and customer issues that customers bring up. And then we're not even talking about the day-to-day scrum. If I'm doing my day-to-day events and if i have like a good cross team board that says all my all my teams are engaged in trying to deal with these items of these epics or these items of these whatever that all roll up to larger business initiatives again assuming that you're a product organization right there's that top column of like the expediter row on some in some yeah you know what i mean i know like exactly you, what you're saying you, you have to be in charge of the expediter row because you kind of span teams as right. well and also you have to be looking out and actively seeking out where capabilities on teams are kind of falling through the cracks and like, oh, well, this team is trying to do this, but they are kind of spinning their reels because they don't have quite the skill and maybe you have the skill, yep. you know? So like, the, again, all of that, everything I just described, Brian, they're like, Brian, you're just throwing a bunch of random stuff. 
when I was a team lead, that was like every day was you might as well, you can make an agenda of what you want to do and then throw it out, throw it out. Because every day when you come in, I, I remember as a team lead, I would wake up in the morning and during my drive, driving along down, <laughs> driving down to work, checking my email. Oh, nobody you know, does that. Yeah, nobody checks their phone and drives. <laughs> I don't advise you to do that, yeah. by the way. Coffee in one hand, phone in the other. Some Somehow I'm driving the car with the wheel. But the point is, like, that's what you do when you're a team lead. You already going to work. You're already getting your mind into gear of, like, what fires am I going to get into? That's this category. Cognitive that, load. So team cognitive load is, like, hey, Ohm. You're a developer lead ohm on this team. I want this feature done and I want to make sure I get it done by the end of the sprint. But in order to do this feature, you also have to make sure that your systems are performing well while it's happening. And then you got to make sure that you're doing good unit tests while it's happening. And then you got to make sure that you're doing automation tests when you first do the feature, because otherwise you'll have to put it in a backlog and incur technical debt. But sometimes maybe you're doing the MVP of the feature. So there's some stuff that you're skipping later. And then the platform that supports this, maybe you need to spin up another platform or a parallel platform. Maybe you need to expand the platform because you expect a lot more customers to be hitting this at the same time. Yep. So the machines need to have a little more power so they don't get bogged down. So now you're you're jockeying the platform and you're jockeying the MVP, but you're thinking about the future. So there's this architect role that you're playing. And also maybe you've made yourself in line with code reviews where the developers have to go to you to do the code reviews. So now you're in the code for every single feature. So at that point, like the, the cognitive load on you is has just become overwhelming just a little yeah. I, I think you're right spot on but the other thing the other thing i'll add is in, to the cognitive load is the planning piece so you're, you're not only just looking at what's going on in this sprint you're also looking to see a sprint out right. maybe a sprint and a half or whatever so all of these things add to the cognitive load by the way why we're we talking about this stuff right it's because as humans we only have a finite capability to process that load and so when you reach a certain amount and it is not the full bucket, yeah. right? You need to stop and say enough. Otherwise, what's going to happen is you will base, there's a term for this. Hang on. It'll come to me in a minute. But what will happen is you won't get anywhere because you've now filled your cognitive load to the, to the right. hilt, right? right? You need to reduce it, give yourself some time. Yeah. And I, I can't think of the term now, but there is a term that says how much you should take on yeah. and it's not a hundred percent yeah the team has to figure it out for themselves yeah you know what what works for them individually we do too so did he did he leave us with suggestions on optimal topologies for flow like is there one are there many or i've ne i've not read the book so i don't know so i'm gonna ask these dumb questions so i, I zoomed in to the main graphic and this comes straight out of the book the main graphic which shows four there's four fundamental topologies topologies meaning there's four different ways that you can structure your teams and i want to zoom over them in an overview for you here so that we can move on to discussing them yeah okay? sure the four topologies are the number one the streamlined teams right which is what we talked about they're they're what i think of as feature teams but they go a little deeper than feature teams because they, because they, they build it, they own it forever, right? The, yeah. And the, on those teams, the streamlined teams, they stay together forever for a long time, and they, they basically they're product teams. Basically, when right. he says streamlined teams, my brain translated it to product teams, yeah. and I was like, okay, it makes total sense. And then I listened to a bit deeper, and he's like, well, they're not quite feature teams because feature teams could are known to take shortcuts and stuff like that. But I was like, yeah, but they're product teams. They are product teams. Yeah, yeah, or you could even if you don't want to say products product teams you could say they're value stream teams for the building you right. could say they're solution aligned team okay. right so yeah go okay ahead. and then uh, the, the next concept the next concept the purple one that spans teams here that you see he calls those enabling teams enabling teams so is this the, is this like the concept out of safe for an enabling team that goes around and you know what I mean? The DevOps, for instance, is a little team that goes around and helps the other teams. Uh, maybe I'm not. I'm not quite sure. Well, like, we'll have to pull up the safe diagram and then right. take a week but off of work to keep, read it. Let's keep but, going. And it, like his his terminology for enabling teams, they help streamline teams, overcome obstacles, and they also detect missing capabilities in the teams. When I think of an enabling team, a lot of times on the podcast, I talk about a team of leads. And the team of leads is where you put your QA engineer, where you put your product designer, where you put your architect, and th those people are shared across teams. Mm -hmm. That's what he means by 
enabling teams. Yeah, yeah. that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Uh, well, it, BAs, you know. where we, we had an episode where we talked about having BAs. Right. Your enabling team would be, they would have all those different resources. An, an, an enterprise agile coach might sit on an enabling, enabling team. The, the interesting thing also is he gives numbers for the ratios. He says you shouldn't have more than six to one. It's between six and nine to one. Streamline teams being the one to these other types of teams. Interesting. I think I might be wrong about that ratio, but I'll double check myself before I post the episode. Sure. But yeah. 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 I don't know where he gets the ratios from. Right. Right. Because that's weird. But uh, yeah, it was very interesting. I, I would think though, I, I know we can come back to this topic. Yeah. The ratios would vary depending on the industry, et cetera. Yeah. Right. Depending on what we're building. I mean. Well, we, well, we haven't got through, like we yeah, haven't yeah, got yeah. through. Like yeah, we're you, only partly uh, through. Yeah, the next one is the complicated subsystem team. The CST. And the complicated subsystem team, it's where significant either mathematical calculation, mathematical slash calculation is the same thing to me, or technical expertise is needed. So you have some kind of subsystem as a piece of your technical architecture that is so complicated, it needs another team to maintain it wholly and pass it to the... So when he first outlined this in the book, I know I was supposed to summarize, I wasn't supposed to talk about each one, but I couldn't resist. When he first outlined this one in the book, I was like, ooh, ooh, you really want to put that in the book? Oh, I don't know. Even he says in the book, this is most organizations' component teams are this. But he's like, if you have a, for example, if you have a legacy system, finance and COBOL, right? Sure. If you have a legacy system that basically it's so difficult to maintain and the cost of change is so high, you just have a handful of people over here that just maintain that system and that's a service. And then other systems just grab and consume from that service. He's like, the downside is other people will never learn that core system because they're just consuming it as a service. He's like, but if the cost of changes are so high or you never need to change it for whatever various business reasons, he's like, that there may be legitimate business reasons why you might want to have a complicated subsystem team. By virtue of having one of those teams, you're also effectively minimizing the possibility of innovating around it to our point about the COBOL systems right, yeah. that are out there in the financial right. industry. You've got expertise that maintains it. So there's no imperative need to go ahead and replace it. Yeah. Just keep it going. He, he does point that out in the book too. He does point out that complicated sus subsystem teams, you are less likely to innovate when you're dealing with a team as a service model. Uh, the, the, this is the same as if you either offshored the whole team or if you decided you were going to bring in a contractor team to just provide this service to maintain this one system and then you, you, you could be hands off. You don't know anything about it. The contract is provided. It's always up. You just yeah. hit the API and you get what you need from it or whatever. You know what I mean? Hit the database yeah. you get what you need from it. Yeah. But that, that's the risk that you take from this. But again, that's why it's a complicated subsystem. Yeah, part of, yeah, I agree. But part of this is also, I don't know if he mentions it, but part of it is also risk mitigation. I mean, complicated systems, we don't want to learn it. We don't want to maintain it. So that's risky. So we'll just defer the risk to another team. Yeah, he, he does not cover any of that in the book because I think I'm making an assumption. I'm not 100% certain. He doesn't cover it in the book. But he's tuned in very well to like modern software development and DevOps, the DevOps movement inside of modern software development. So he does he doesn't point out that specifically, but he does point out a lot of people kind of fool themselves in thinking, oh, our subsystem is very complicated. So now we have to slice the cake horizontally and say the database layer and the whatever layer and the API, the back end team and the front end team. And he does specifically call it as like, those are not complicated subsystems. No. Yeah. I agree. He even goes into saying like in, in like a DBA, for example, like you, uh, the enabling team would be the place to have a DBA yeah. and, and the DBA, even in that, even in that role, the DBA doesn't serve as the person that writes the code. The, the DBA just serves as the database coach to the stream aligned teams to help them figure out how to interact best with the mm -hmm. database. Right. And there are methods in which members of the enabling team help the streamline teams. We'll go into the, the he says there's three, there's three yeah. methods and we'll go into that here in okay. a second. But the, the complicated subsystem teams that I want to spend a minute to talk about that. Cause a, a lot of people are going to mess that one up to be like, Oh, look, he says that we can do silo teams. component silo teams. <laughs> that is not what no, they, you know, not no. what these are. 
Agreed. When I heard this one, I was thinking about some kind of like a Kafka system, some kind of integrated API system is like, well, you can make changes to the hardest system, but like, should you really make changes to the hardest system? Like you, you can, but if you really want to make changes to a, the heart of a very complicated system, like I'm, I'm talking about cracking open libraries and making changes, like you, you need probably people. need a complicated yeah. subsystem team yeah. to deal with that level of, no doubt. Uh, and then his last team here is a platform team. And his definition of platform team is a grouping of other team types that provide a compelling internal product to accelerate delivery by stream aligned teams. Accelerate it's interesting. delivery. He, yeah. he puts it in, the, in terms of a compelling internal product. Right. My mind went to a compelling internal service. Yeah. As a platform team, you're serving the other team or right. teams, right? Right, right, right? Maybe that's what he means. It, the it service is, is the is. product. Yeah, it yeah. is. Okay. Yeah, the ser- the service, but, but but teams as a service, he's using that term in the book for the complicated subsystem team where you you don't really get it's a black box, you don't really get a peek into how it works. The platform teams are the ones that are for example, in other places I worked, I used to maintain a VM farm and the VM farm would serve the QA department. Sometimes the developers would use machines in my room, but usually it was QA. And they would ask like, hey, I need a machine spun off with these tools installed, uh, uh, this brand of Windows, <laughs> this version of Windows with these service packs or these updates, yeah. and I need these tools pre-installed, and I need it fresh, and I need a snapshot that I can roll back to and whatever, and I need, because I need to do install testing. They would give me, they'd let me know what I need, and then I would, peel them off a fresh machine so they didn't need to even deal with right. setting up windows and configuring hardware and getting compute together and figuring out what server it should run on and all, all that kind all, of like yeah all the fun stuff yeah 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 all the fun stuff once they got the machine all of their access and permissions and stuff were already rolled onto it for them mm-hmm. so so they didn't need it all of that stuff that's what i think of when i think of platform team but it also could be a team that takes care of you're provisioning for developer environments, for example. Like an infra team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was interviewing for positions doing this job for a while of a like a developer enablement type of product owner where your job was just to drive around to development teams and be like, what would make you more efficient? Right. You know, there's a, there's, there's a lot of uh, roles out there that are just specifically for this. But that, that's what he means by platform teams. And, and he uses the word internal on purpose to mean they serve internal users it's internal to the organization yeah yeah so this is good i i, I think that I, I get the topologies and the the four fundamental constructs here's where i'm having a little bit of a discomfort i guess okay. how does this sit with the idea that a scrum team should have all the skills they need on the team yeah now we're saying no right uh, you've got a team that's it's gonna need another team over there another one over there mm-hmm. so how does how do you juxtapose those two things well his his or well, his is there because there's two people worked, but yeah. their streamline team is your typical scrum team that they are cross-functional they have all the skill they need to deal with things where he is not necessarily seeking to take things away from those teams but where he's seeking to 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 make them where he's seeking to where he's seeking to help those teams is by taking cognitive load off of them to deal with all this extra stuff. So if you're trying to understand a deep, deep business domain and you're trying to experiment with different features Mm -hmm. and try different things, maybe you could take off of that team the bulk of the work having to do with optimizing how they're interacting with the database. Mm-hmm. and give them somebody from the enabling team to help them kind of knock that out while they are focusing on the business problems yeah. that they're trying to solve. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in, when he's talking about streamline team, in the chapter he's talking about streamline teams, he does say streamline teams should be cross-functional. They should have all the ability and all the skill they need, j- just like the scrum guide would say. Okay. So he's not taking any of that away, but he does come at it from the focus of reducing cognitive load yes this is an interesting angle I, it's one that i hadn't thought about before yeah. reduce cognitive load slow down to speed up right yeah i love it okay so that's the four that, that is that is the four fundamental topologies i'll put this on the screen because like i said you're seeing this for the first time stream aligned teams 
own an entire slice of the business domain end to end. Streamline teams are you build it, you run it teams, or you build it, you own it is what I would say. Yeah. There are no hand handoffs. To hand other teams. Yeah. No handoffs. Yeah. Okay. So you build it, you own it. And then diagram is snapshot in time. Team relationships will change as new goals are set. All right. And then he goes into the, the three interaction modes between teams. We did a podcast on like how teams talk to one another, interact with one another. Right. This this is this is that this is that basically. Right. So there's there's three there's three interaction modes. So four types of teams, three ways teams interact. The three the three ways teams interact are acts as a service, facilitating, and collaboration. Yep. And you see he tries to make his graph. I don't think this is a great graph, but he no. tries to make his graph encompass how the different types of teams absorb the different types of interaction modes. So the only three ways in which teams should interact and any way that's not in this list is waste. According to this book, collaboration, I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to summarize them this time instead of doing what I did last time. Collaboration defined as working together for a defined period of time to discover new things. Okay new things he terms as APIs, practices, technologies, etc. X as a service, meaning one team provides and one team consumes something as a service. Let's go back to my Kafka model, right? And then the other one is facilitation. One team helps and mentors another team. So uh, facilitation, if you, if you page up here, like the facilitating, if you think about purple as his enabling team, because that's what purple is in his graph is enabling team in his enabling team model it makes sense that the enabling team will get two teams together and get them talking to say, Hey, if we're taking this from your piece of the software and this from your piece of the software and making them talk to each other, mm -hmm. we did this uh, once at a customer where we, we wanted two APIs to talk to each other. And there, there's a specific thing that you have to do to make two APIs talk to each other. We didn't have that. So we were, we were, we had to figure out how to make two APIs kind of cross streams to talk to each other. But uh, that's this, it was, th there was a lead in the room who had to facilitate the two teams working out how things happen. The con in your example, it'd be the contract, right? For the yeah. APIs to communicate. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, okay. Th there's a collaboration, right? Collaboration and working together. So they, they literally are working together. Collaboration could be for this sprint, person is going to come off my team and teach this other team how to use whatever that, that, that could be collaborating. It could be joining together for a review where your two teams are together in a refinement, for example, working out how we're going to combine to build something. That would be a good example of uh, collaboration. Although arguably that could be facilitation as well. Right? Yeah. So I just wanted to point out to the scrum masters out there, don't get into this policy of the team should stay together and then this team should stay together. Collaboration, when you have more than one team involved, yeah, and it takes many, many forms, including secondment and all of these other yeah. techniques that are out there. So, yeah, use them. Yeah. And then probably the easiest one to understand on here is X as a service. Right. So we're providing this to you. And then what you see is what you get. And you don't really get to see beyond like how it, how whatever does, whatever it does, doesn't really matter. A lot of uh, firms that use heavy, heavy contractors do do this model where the contract team is going to do this. And then when they're done, we'll consume what they do. And then we don't really know. We don't know how they do what they do. It doesn't matter. Just, yeah. just deliver us what's asked basically. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, makes yeah. Sense. Each of these models has, has a pro and a con. I mean, the X as a service model is like, look, if you just got some money and you want to get some stuff done and you don't have a, a, a deficit in the a budgetary area, throw some money at a team X as a service. You get what you get. This is my plumbing model, Brian. Yeah. You could replace the plumbing in your home, but do you want to? If you have money, call in a plumber. 24 7 plumbers yeah. are available. Look, listen. It costs some you, you, money, but. You get water on the other end. That's what you want, exactly. right? Exactly. You want reliable water that doesn't spill all over your ceiling. <laughs> That's what you get. Right. So, but when you go in your attic, don't complain that the pipes are all crisscross and you sure. don't know where it's where and that right. there's no shutoff valves anywhere. Like, don't complain about that. X as a service. You get what you get. And uh, you don't throw a fit, as mm. I would say to my kids. <laughs> and then, like, facilitation. What is the difference between facilitation and collaboration? Only? That's what I need help with. Yeah. Collaboration, it really is, is the teams doing, uh, working together by 
themselves organically. So the teams get team A, team B. They get together, they work together. Yeah. If they're not doing that or they're not doing that as well as they could, you need to facilitate. Now, who is the you? Could be anybody. Could be somebody from team A, could be somebody from team B. Could be a facilitation team, as is the case in this model, right? The enabling, enabling team. Or yeah. enable, sorry, enabling. yeah, the enabling team. They will come out and they, somebody from that team. Yeah, that's what he points out or in the, in the graph. bodies from that team, depending on the size of it, right? They would come out and make sure that people are talking, synthesizing ideas, and so forth. Yeah. That's his whole concept. In it's the- interesting. Uh, what I'd like to know, and I, maybe he says this in the book, he mentioned in the book, are there examples of organizations using this how whether successfully or not he won't mention if it's not successful but you know what i mean i'd like to know about company names that where this is being done effectively yeah he does give examples in the book i don't know if they're available on the website i'm looking right now sure but to buy my book to learn about the examples on yeah that's right and that's okay maybe i'll I'll buy the book i don't mind docker desktop okay so he's using that yeah, he uses, improbable. Docker, he uses Docker as an example. He uses Improbable as an example. Nav, I don't know. Norwegian, Norwegian Labor, Labor and Welfare. Welfare. Wealth Wizards. I like any company that has wizards in the title. Yeah, and wealth. I Interesting mean, they, take, though. I, I think the idea of recognizing that there is a finite amount of this, this entropy called cognitive load that sits well with me. I think we're all, we all have limits. Yeah. So that sits well with me. Yeah. Using st- structures such as the four that he recommends, right? Okay, that makes sense. What I didn't see, and it's probably in the book, I need to buy the book. How do these, these structures help you reduce or not reduce, optimize, optimize the cognitive load for get optimal delivery? I, I don't know that. What happens if you do three out of the four? Do you, do you get some benefit or none? Uh, right? I, I mean, it doesn't really go into fine tuning. He says you will need stream align teams in every case. Yeah, agreed. but you don't necessarily need all the rest of the teams. And figuring out what the optimal balance is for you, he doesn't deal with that in the book, as far as I recall. That's Again, that, I, yeah. I read it this week, so I mean, my memory is total garbage. But I don't recall him going into depth and, and if you've read this book and you have references like feel free to blast me in the comments about it but other than giving general ratios of if you have this many streamlined teams you probably need i, I want to say it was between six to one and nine to one of, of those these aren't other big, types of teams those aren't big overheads really when you no. think about it right no, no, no. that's pragmatic i right. think uh, if it said two to three two to one or three to one you might say well yeah. who has that kind of money yeah. but you know yeah that makes sense to me right yeah. but a lot of it is unfortunately that old consultants answer right it depends because the industry is different and so on so you got to figure it out but i think if you th- start thinking about it from this perspective right that you can structure your teams in this way yeah. and then i think there's something there for sure let's pull up a few examples Things? we're looking for a summary and like the summary that he gives on conway's law is pretty good it says basically tactical leaders must have a say in organizational design because they were if the organizational design is going to follow the software design but also if the software design is going to follow the organizational design and we can never separate those two that's the concept of conway's law if we can't separate those two then the people that are doing both have to have a say in both conversations yeah break that coconut i like that bullet that bullet that says minimize intrinsic cognitive load Eliminate extraneous cognitive load to leave room for a germane cognitive load. I have no idea what any of that means. No, I don't either. Sounds good. No, I think what he's saying is get rid of, minimize, get rid of everything that is internal that's not needed, right? Certainly eliminate, get rid of everything that's extraneous. And what that leaves you with is just enough to be able to really thrive, right? Because you don't have any excess. You don't have anything extraneous that you don't need. You don't have anything extra internally that you don't need as well so yeah. it's optimizing the flow I, I get that i do get that it's a big word isn't it uh, I don't, uh, relevant it means relevant relevant to subject yeah. or under consideration germane what a weird word why don't you just say relevant do you get paid i think, I think germane predates relevant probably I, but i mean minimize intrinsic cognitive load eliminate extraneous cognitive load but uh, this goes back to what I was saying. When when you get to a point where you're 
you know, where I got to a point where I, when I was a lead, when I was a team lead, I'm like, well, I'm, I'm getting the platforms ready. I got to know about all the projects that are happening. I'm also in their backlog refinements, so I got to know about the strategy. But also, I, I got, I'm at the team level, so I need to know the tactical at the status update level. But then I also get, get called in to help with specific features where I am the domain expert because I'm the business expert in some domains. How many different teams am I going to span? How many different jobs am I going to span? And that's yeah. kind of this. It, that's exactly this. So all of those external ones or yeah. the extraneous is a good word, right? They're not directly relevant in yeah. your lane. Get rid of them is what he's saying. Yeah. And it's hard to argue against that. I, I think that's right. Ratio of stream aligned versus others. I like that. I like that he breaks it down to basically everything else. Like stream aligned is the core. Right. Versus everything else. And I want to say in the book that I read, it was between six to one to nine to one. This is the number I remember mm -hmm. from reading six, six to one between six to one and nine to one. So for six teams, you have an enabling team for six teams or for nine teams, uh, like nine teams. Most certainly once you have nine teams that are delivering your features and your, your software, basically, you probably need a team that just deals with the environments. Yeah, and, I would say yeah, so. Making things that are, yeah, making sure things that are kind of moving along. Once you have six teams, you probably, and you have a database in the equation, you probably need a DBA full time helping you out, DBA. So that those numbers, you could probably make an argument, depending on your workplace, you need more or less or whatever, but they're pretty good ratios to yeah, start I'd, with. I say so too. I think that if you think about all the dynamics that happen with six teams or nine teams, then yeah, definitely makes sense. Uh, right? You know what's interesting too is if you go with the Scrum Guide. Well, I don't, I don't know if it's in the Scrum Guide, but if you go with the like the Scrum Alliance certifications and stuff, and you shouldn't have a Scrum Master over more than two teams, then I wonder if this six to one applies to Agile coaches. You sit in Agile Coach. There is really no guidance as far as I know, I know out there. I know, but if you think about an enabling team, they contain a BA, they contain an Agile Coach, they contain a maybe a DBA, maybe they contain a system architect. You know what I mean? A system architect just meaning a full stack advanced developer. You know what I mean? A senior developer. That 61 number, it's looking pretty good right yeah. now about like, I don't know, like that, maybe that's where I park my Agile code. So if, 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 this, if the organization is paying attention to those numbers and is not loading your teams down with more than two to one scrum masters, you're talking about a Agile coach who now is kind of looking over and helping out three scrum masters and then nine to one maximum for four or five scrum masters. I, that's pretty yeah. believable. Yeah. I mean, that. That's pretty believable. And so if you're looking at that end of the spectrum, nine, let's say, yeah. right? And if, if you've got fairly novice scrum masters, you probably are going to struggle as an agile coach. You, but in reality, you'll have a mix. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's believable. Yeah, yeah. And, and nine is a real weird number because I think nine, nine would most likely be you have eight teams and one of your scrum masters is temporarily stretching to cover three teams while you are trying to figure out what to do with this extra team or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't think nine, nine is a very weird number, yeah. but again, like a, a getting a full-time agile coach to sit on your enabling team and help your four, your whatever, three, four scrum masters. Like that's a, that's a very believable number. I agree. Uh, where they're not overloaded. They can, like they can still with eight teams, six teams, whatever. They can still occasionally pop in to different events, help people along when people are out or if people quit or bring, they can substitute for a while until you get a replacement. That, that's a, that, a sustainable is the word that comes to my brain. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that yeah. seems sustainable to me. Too good. Can't do it. <laughs> Too good. Can't do it. Okay. Um, <laughs> Ooh, I like the last one. Can we look at that one? Team owning a product needs to have some responsibility for its commercial viability. Yeah, we'll go to the Silicon yeah, yeah. Valley product group that, for this that, one. We'll go, we'll go straight over here for this discussion. The team owning owning a, uh, owning a product needs to have some responsibility for its commercial viability. I mean, that just runs straight into the Marty Kagan. Like your business viability is where I shuffle commercial viability. Same thing, the exact same thing to me. Yeah, yeah. In addition to that, your product person on the team needs to be dealing with all four of these and if your product person is not dealing with all four of these and it, you like like feasibility well let, let's go through each one of these yeah, like real 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 quick because we went in i think then trish's episode we talked about this i can't remember but uh, business viability 
and commercial viability, meaning value, like will customers actually buy it versus will the solution work for the business? Those are kind of tied together, loosely tied together. That's what he's talking about here. But there's yeah. also feasibility, meaning can we actually build what we're talking about? And then usability, can users actually use it? Like usability, if you're lucky enough to have a system designer in-house, they can help you with this. And feasibility, your engineers can help you with this. So I feel if you have a, a well-formed product team who are helping your engineering team, you have, you have a product owner, yeah. you have a dev team members or whatever. If you're not trying to shortcut things, it's pretty easy to not lose track of any of these. I was uh, I was about to say it's pretty easy to knock these out. That's not true. That's like a full time job. <laughs> it is a full time job. But it, it's pretty easy to not get caught in a position where you forgot about one of these. Yeah, I concur with that. Uh, it's interesting though that uh, the skeleton and pies they say that. Uh, yeah. I'm assuming they do from this summary, right? Yeah. It's interesting that because to me a lot of times teams don't really extend their reach into commercial or business liability they're like well we're just gonna build what's asked of us right if it doesn't work or nobody buys it it's not my fault but the reality is they really should be thinking this through because the solution can be that much more oriented towards success if they're thinking it through like well, who's gonna who are the users will they use them where do they use them how are these yeah well they, i mean if if you're uh, i think of people reading this book that it's like kind of like like the people that would read this book that's kind of life-changing for them like they're they're stuck working under a cto or something they don't ever get to talk to customers they don't even ever get to talk about customers you know i mean they they've yeah. never seen a user persona they don't know what it's for uh, yeah, the people do live in that world so i'm not going to talk bad that's a that's a bad thing but if you're going to come from that environment and read this book like this book is going to change your whole world perspective to be like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah. I have to think about these four categories and I'm all over here by myself. Like, no, you, you shouldn't be over here by yourself. Exactly. I think that was the point, right? The team yeah. should be thinking about it. So you have you, your team. Or you should be reaching out to your enabling team to say, hey, my designer sits on my enabling team and let me get that skill. Just like we were talking about with BAs several episodes ago, it's like somebody in the organization has that skill. I would like somebody from my enabling team to sit with our team for a couple of sprints to help us understand how to better break stories and how to better think about the customer first when we're doing this work yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Help it. You, they don't have to change all your practices all at once. They just have to help you get turned to be pointed down the road you should be going. Not even necessarily help you go down the road. Yeah. Just, just help me turn to see more clearly where I should be going. Yeah, just help you shape up those practices that are germane. That's the word, Brian. Germane. It's germane. Germane is like a, <laughs> s some dude from Australia to me. So what's next on this? Just uh, do it all and uh, you'll be successful and buy my book and, uh, and consult with him if you're struggling. Yeah. The summary here is the majority of teams are streamlined teams. If you need extra teams, plug them in for the purposes of reducing your cognitive load on your streamline teams. <laughs> I guess the thing we didn't talk about in this podcast is what if we're just a big angry mob of people that just randomly get delegated tasks? <laughs> we're a team of 50, you know? Yeah, your oh. cognitive load is through the roof. <laughs> oh, boy. But you have your streamline teams, which makes up the majority. And then you have specific enabling teams that might have skill that is just like too expensive to, to have on every single streamline team. Or maybe it's very, very specific. You have complicated subsystem teams if you need them for truly overly complicated subsystems right and potentially you have platform teams that are just internally focused teams that advance and empower your other teams to get them where they're going faster that's basically all they do and there's three ways that teams interact with each other which is acts as a service facilitating and collaborating which i will always mess up the distinction between facilitating and collaborating like facilitating is like i get somebody outside to help me work with other people the other one is my team just works with other people a facilitator could be from within your team they're I just simply be, yeah. they're they're a catalyst they're just simply all they're doing really is they're stoking the fire to keep it going they're starting it's, to keep, keep it going basically they're making sure the interactions are happening without mm -hmm. hindrance right mm -hmm. they're making sure that uh, everybody has a voice somebody doesn't have a dominant voice that runs away with it yeah Th that's what they're doing 
but in in the facilitating model, you're not actually doing the work. No. You're facilitating work. In the collaboration model, you actually are working together. Exactly. Oh, yes. Okay, yes. Okay. You're working and collaboration is to me not a singular thing like it's not one person or this person is collaborating you need more than one to collaborate yes. so the team collaborates maybe the team collaborates with another team now it could just be one team member from team a and one team member from team b more likely it's going to be several based on what's needed right? right it could be a few testers from here and whatever whatever it is that's collaboration facilitation is usually one person orchestrating the meeting to the point where is making the conditions ideal for that collaboration to happen mm -hmm. i don't know if that helped at all yeah well I, yeah help me I hope it's a bit more clear now the, the interesting part about this is like a facilitation is like when when that person actively stops facilitating y you stop they yeah so sometimes a team member that's facilitating can also be a collaborator but they need to then be clear about that like right, they need yeah. to say okay now this typically happens with scrum masters when they say well i'm facilitating and then when they want to have a, an opinion because they may have a technical background or whatever they should say now i'm speaking as right. a developer or as a tester as opposed to a scrum master because messaging gets confusing otherwise right the yeah. team, some team members will go well because you said so i thought that's the direction so yeah, they're yeah. not a project manager right uh, they're not dictating the work or direction so yeah right they need to be cleared so i'm stepping out of my role as a scrum master yeah. now and i'm stepping in as a potential developer maybe yeah but especially if you're on that if you're on that enablement team i could see them take your word as scripture and be like well you you said we should do it this way so we're not gonna we didn't want to challenge that or we didn't want to ask right right because yeah. you're seen as the expert right yeah, yeah. that would well well I, I mean also i don't even really want to challenge this because it kind of it's it's a very flimsy viewpoint but in the spirit of arguing agile they're on the enabling team so there is a certain amount of seniority inherent because they're already on the enabling team yeah so it like wouldn't that mean that when they do suggest something you probably should take it seriously they're, they're, I, I understand they're just giving you a suggestion from the enable, enabling team but then if you don't take that suggestion and, you, and then you still fail like that that kind of organization is going to be viewed as like bad on you the, if the direction they're providing is from the standpoint of expertise because yeah. they have that expertise right, right. that you need yeah. then yeah by all means yeah. I and mean, that's why they're there on the other hand if they're coming in simply just to go back to that facilitation thing right just making sure that the team speaks to one another you don't really need that team to come in and do that it could be any team that comes in and does that it right. could be anybody from the organization that can do yeah, that because yeah. they don't bring the technical know-how with them yeah. all they bring is how to get the team to work together skills so I think these, these two to me are distinct, right? They're different. So if you've got somebody from that other team that we talked about, what was the name of that again? The enabling the team? Enabling, yeah, the enabling team. Inherently, that they have the skills and the expertise to suggest what you should be doing, right? right? At least options anyway. Now, you can lean back against that and say, well, what about this? What about that? And talk through that. These guys are the experts, though. They've done it before. Yeah. They're like your mentors, basically. Yeah. So, yeah, take take their advice and try something out. Yeah. By all means. that's I think that's the idea behind an enablement. They enable you yeah. to move forward. Right. But yeah, yeah. That, that's what I think, too. I, I, and I suggest this a lot when, with team design, especially when I'm kind of pushed back into the agile coaching spot. We should start with the teams that are asking for help. I know I, I, I brought this up from the perspective of like, well, what if they kind of ignore your advice? You know, well, then why are you why are you dealing with people that are ignoring your advice? That's why I said I, didn't, I really didn't even yeah. want to bring it up because like, why are you giving advice to people who don't want advice? <laughs> like that, right. That's kind of silly in the first place to do that. But there could be a reason why you, uh, they've called you in specifically for help. And then they're taking your suggestion and saying, well, we can't exactly do that because they know their segment of the business. They know what's right. gonna fly and what's not. Right. But maybe they'll try something, like you, you can't get upset about that. But there's part of me that says you, you should somehow be tracking, as part of the enablement team, you should have enough experience to know when customizing things is gonna work the best and when going by the book is gonna work the best. You, you, you really should, yeah. I agree with that, absolutely, you should. You should be open to that lean back from the team saying, well, in our world that may not work, 
but ask those questions right ask those open ended questions why do you think that might be and see what they say maybe they have valid points it might be because we're dealing with this regulatory industry or whatever whatever it is i don't know right but so they learn from that so every engagement they have they have they learn from it but yeah you're right they, they need to be open to it yeah. they can't just come in and like force fit their stuff right and so i say so you do this no yeah. it doesn't work that way all right yeah all of this it is far more effective in an organization where you can try things rather than an organization where, hey, what I say is the law and that's the end of it. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if an organization that's like that, I don't think they ever would pick up and try any of these concepts in the first place. So they probably wouldn't have to deal with anything we're talking about today. Yeah, I agree with that. Those organizations will be probably risk averse and they wouldn't want to stand up these right. kinds of structures anyway. Yeah. So yeah, it wouldn't work in that case. Yeah, because there's a certain amount of trust in the streamlined teams. Yep. Because again, going back to Conway's law, like a typical hierarchical organization would never split their teams up this way. But also, if they were to split their teams up this way, I would see that they would put their leads or project managers, or whatever, on the enabling team and say, oh, these people are here to enable you. Except they're, they wouldn't, like, that's not their job to enable you. Their, their job is to force you into compliance. Dictate and, to you. Yeah, yeah right, exactly. Right, yeah. 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 Uh, they, they'll do exactly what they're doing today but with new titles yeah right yeah i agree with you that just doesn't work that's interesting i kind of wonder about team sizes and enabling teams and team sizes and stuff like that because i I feel there's a lot more on i i want to stop this topic because we we're at the edge of like a factual review of the material we're we're at the edge of that now because i want to dig into it a lot more with a lot of themes that we talk about on the podcast normally about uh, like maybe like is an hr recruiter like is there enough for a nine to one enablement team to put my HR person there or are they going to be bored most of the time <laughs> you know what I mean like yeah I want to dig into how does this look for the rest of the organization can I finally break up my HR hatchet man organization where they're just there to fire people and right. run payroll and then I don't I don't know the take, spreadsheet pundits go, yeah, go yeah. <laughs> take off to the beach after that I don't I don't know what they do after that like uh, they play golf don't they yeah I guess yeah. I guess but I don't know if there's enough there, and I, I want to dig into that one and kind of ask some questions about it. But I also want to just put this whole podcast in my pocket and save it for when we have an HR person to break out. Like, hey, this is a way that you could structure your whole organization. Even if you scale the enablement teams. Oh, boy. Look, it's the concept <laughs> that. Even if you scale the enablement teams, what is the top enablement team? Well, it should be the leadership team. I mean, it should be, or maybe, I guess you could say that the leadership team is a streamlined team, but they really don't seem like a streamlined no, team. No, no, they're, they're over the streamlined teams to me because right. a streamlined team is a subset of a business domain, right? Right, yes. Uh, and the yes. leadership team is like, they, right, they flat may re- across yeah, the top. They may represent several business domains, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but to your point, though, they may have somebody fairly senior, I imagine, right, from, in our example, HR right. or, or it could be legal or whatever, yeah. right? So I think going back to the premise of having six or maybe nine teams and having somebody from these other business domains on the team, that's an interesting idea. Because let's say you had one person from any of these domains, let's say HR, mm-hmm. and they would come onto your team. How, how would that work? Would they come onto your team as in like they're part of your team? You're or are they part of the enablement team and they come on as needed? There's so many different variations to this model. I, I would think that they they live on the enablement team. And second it to a team as needed? But, but they are dedicated to whatever team as necessary, yeah. team or teams as necessary for whatever recs are open at the time. Now, that, that could get real messy if like we have a, a slew of people quitting and one person on each of five teams quits at once and now they're now they're just overwhelmed with trying to hire and uh, this is assuming that they're that your hr people also do recruiting because recruiting and hr could be separate disciplines so i bring it up because i i don't really know you know what i mean i don't really know maybe recruit maybe your recruiters are part of their own part of their own enablement team i'm gonna screw this up every time maybe the recruiters are part of their own streamlined team but you have a rep on your 
enablement team that connects you to the recruiting team when you need to use their services like team as a service type mm-hmm. of deal yeah maybe that's the way to look at it i don't yeah. know I, i'm sure we could riff on this for another hour well, i'm sure know? we could but i kind of want to stop right where we're at sure just because like it'd be better to have the discussion we're trying to have now now that it's a, a logical kind of questioning you know what i mean like we could whiteboard out this is what a typical yeah. organization looks like you know sure I, uh, most organizations their products they don't have nine teams that are delivering on their products i mean even if someone's like i have 300 developers ha 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 like you don't you don't have right but trust me the other people have smaller development teams under them and they're under you like the the, the organization doesn't really break down like that but uh, th- this book was very helpful because a lot of stuff that i talk about on the podcast for the ideal and optimum team sizes and team types and what they do kind of aligns to uh, what what I talk about feature teams, I'm talking about streamlined teams. They, they, they do more than just a feature. Sure. And they could handle platform and they could handle the, the very specific complicated subsystems, components, whatever you want to call it. They could handle those things. But at a certain point, when this, either the system grows or the teams grow, you need to take certain things out to relieve your teams of the stress of having to deal with what they call cognitive load. Mm-hmm. of dealing with just a, a million different things that aren't necessarily related to each other, but that you do need to figure out how to work with in order to be successful on your streamlined team. Yeah, I, I agree. This whole thing is, to, at least I haven't had the the opportunity to have read the book, but this whole thing is basically around filling your mind space with only those things that matter, right? right. And then yeah. organizing the organizational structure with teams that can help one another right so they catalyze yeah the well largely it's the stream aligned teams that need catalyzing and these other teams are helping enabling to use their term so yeah, yeah. i like it i like i like it on on the surface of it i'd like to scratch a little deeper into this yeah. a little more i yeah, think yeah, yeah. but yeah i think we should wait until we get somebody from hr or legal yeah and we'll yeah, take yeah. this with further with them yeah well, that's that's this podcast. This is this this impromptu cut cut to the front of the line podcast about team topologies. Like I said, it was it was a very very quick book. It's it's worth the if you are in software development, it's worth the read. Or if you're a, if you're like a product manager or whatever, and you're adjacent to software development where you maybe you didn't come up through the teams or whatever, but you you still work with developers every day. It's worth reading, just to kind of understand like oh th- this is the way that your teams are structured probably mirrors the architecture of the software and vice versa. And so like if you don't really know much about the architecture of the software and you're like, I don't really understand why my teams are set up this way. Now you might yeah. actually know a bit more about the architecture of the software. But if you don't, maybe if you're listening to this podcast, it will help you think about and think a bit deeper about the environment in which you live. Yeah, absolutely. Hey. That's it for this podcast. The podcast of dressing down super quick podcast this week. And uh, hey, like and subscribe. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Let, let us know what you think down in the comments. Yeah, when, I was just wondering, uh, we're talking about all these things from the 60s. When did Conway come out with his law? In 1967, I think we looked at ah, it. Ah, another 60s. Who was the guy that came up with the, uh, the forming, norming, storming, performing model? That was uh, Tuckman. Tuckman's yeah, Tuckman. Model. Tuckman did that. He came up with that in the 60s too. So the 60s were uh, interesting. And yeah, there it is, 1965. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, organizational psychology. Yeah, I don't think they've really developed on top of this. So they added a journey. That was about it. Yeah, in 1977, Tuckman revisited this with Marianne Jensen and added a journey. Which is what we're about to do on this podcast. <laughs>